just as background for the premise of this talk, in terms of drug development statistics, I think we've all heard these facts at one point or another, but I took the liberty to consolidate them for you here today. We know that even just in the last decade that R&D total costs have increased incrementally about one and a half times from 10 years ago to $48.5 billion um, in 2012. However, although I did just see a report yesterday saying that we're on track potentially to have a banner year for drug development, um, similar to what was achieved in 2012 with around 40 drugs approved, uh, on average, there's been only about 26 drugs approved each year, 27 last year. Now, some of the recent surge has been um, around the fast track programs implemented by the FDA. However, I would say that in the implementation of those fast track programs, probably you are having a lot of use of time response modeling to maximize the data that are um, being produced to support um, being able to fast track the drug. Um, the other thing that's sort of worrisome as regards the state of rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune disease in general is that we're still only, you know, everybody learned about one in 10 drugs that makes it in phase one makes it in phase three. So even with all our advances today in terms of science, ability, et cetera, we're not getting past that one in 10 drugs um, making it through to approval. Next slide, please. Sorry, that was supposed to be me. I apologize. <laughs> Technology is always sometimes a, a tricky thing. So, you know, in terms of saying what, what, what can we do to streamline uh, drug development approaches, and certainly what are we seeing um, in organizations today, obviously everybody's being asked to do more with less. There's an added financial pressure to succeed. It has been more difficult to find novel drugs. There are novel drugs in development. And I'm always excited to see them. There are a lot of drugs that may be considered Me Too's, and how do you then um, work to try to differentiate or streamline the development of those drugs when you, when you have a drug that may not be novel in terms of mechanism of action. We also have seen increasingly, because we have many effective drugs for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, that the standards for what is acceptable in terms of data are increasing, uh, not only in terms of the subpopulations, the safety focus, so we're no longer held to the ICHGCP standards of, um, you know, 300, 600, 1,500 patients. You're often seeing 2,500 patients or more in the safety databases, um, and those, you know, therefore meet into regulatory requirements, but also for EMA, and then the FDA has been going along with this. It seems like that, you know, increasing need, if not for the regulatory purposes, but also for the payers um, having to do head-to-head -head studies in your development program. And then, unfortunately, development costs as a result of all of this are increasing um, exponentially. You have in the 70s where you were only using about $140 million to take a drug to market that now we're looking at about $1.2 billion for a successfully approved drug. And that, of course, is taking into account um, failures along the way. But certainly, uh, we all agree, I think, that that's an astronomical number. When we think about drug development, I think all of us have sort of learned the standard, standard current development model. Certainly, it's what I learned about drug development in medical school. You did the traditional phase one, you went to phase two, you went to phase three to file. You did your simple analyses that were focused primarily on trial endpoints. There wasn't a lot of reading the in-between-the-lines data, so to speak. There has also been just sort of a separate approach to looking at efficacy data as one part of it and then safety data as another part of it and then just trying to say, okay, well, it looks like it has a favorable risk-benefit profile. And phase twos really aren't all that novel. They are just sort of the practice setting for phase three. Um, maybe we're not optimizing the data that we're obtaining in phase two settings. If we want to streamline drug development, though, I think some of the ways to look at it is, you know, his, what does history teach us? And history teaches us um, why drugs fail, though, even when we use the standard development model. 
And I think, um, you know, everybody recognizes, so if we look at the bottom of the pyramid on the slide, a median day delay of 435 days to approval after an initial submission for approval means a lot of time and money. Usually you've already had your sales force hired, you've already been launching, you know, that year and a, almost year and a half delay to approval is significant. And then if we look at why those delays occur, almost 50% of them are actually reasons, and these are actually the top three reasons for failure. But these top three reasons for failures are things that can be addressed potentially with time response modeling. So dose selection, the actual choice of endpoint was not necessarily agreed, uh, as well as inconsistent endpoint results. So for example, in rheumatoid arthritis, if we look at um, you know, uh, recently with a drug that did not meet approval, EMA did point out discrepancies between the DAS-28 results versus the um, ACR-20 results, and that was some cause for concern. So if we look at the value of adding modeling to your drug development plans, this is actually a quote from someone within our own organization, Rick Sachs, who heads up our Center for Integrated Drug Development. But really, you know, we want to integrate information to determine what is known, and more importantly, to determine the unknown. And so, you know, going back to what I said about reading between the lines on the data, but we want to improve our understanding of the compound earlier in development, not only for the go decisions, but the no-go decisions. Um, we want to maximize our learnings from other compounds and endpoints in rheumatoid arthritis. We have many, many compounds now. Many of the changes that we're seeing in terms of the new guidances reflect our learnings from those compounds where traditionally we're starting to see where people are driving for a 12-week um, primary endpoint. But we also want to optimize um, our doses not only on efficacy in that 12-week endpoint, but on safety and really determine the therapeutic window for those compounds.